Well, Revolution, um, I don't usually like to stand up here because it's not my thing. Um, so bear with me as I press through my anxiety. Um, but I really felt strongly the Lord impressing upon me to share some stuff with respect to Rev groups and Connect groups that we've had. Um, Lord placed on, on my heart to open my home and lead a worship, a, a, a small group um, some months ago. And even prior to that, you know, we kind of launched at the mall a, uh, a group where we would meet and do a study. And through those connect groups, I felt, you know, um, we got a chance to not only deepen our relationship in the word with, with, with the Lord, but even with each other. And even as I felt led and impressed to open my home and do a, a group to, to study, um, I felt God was doing a mighty thing uh, as we come together. I felt guards were kind of being lowered and we were able to, you know, encourage one another um, in his word. Um, and that's part of, you know, uh, what his word says to, you know, open our homes, break bread. And, um, you know, uh, as we operate out of those unique things that he's deposited in us, that we're able to build each other up and encourage each other in the Lord. Um, so uh, I'm just going to read Ephesians 4.16. Uh, For his body has been formed in his image and is closely joined together and constantly connected as one as every member has been given divine gifts to contribute to the growth of all, and as these gifts operate effectively throughout the whole body, we are built up and made perfect in love. And I feel Rev Groups is a great opportunity for that um, as we come together um, to, to connect. And again, uh, as each one operates out of their unique giftings, we were able to build each other up. And I, I, I've seen um, some just powerful uh, things in the groups that I've been plugged into. So it's important, you know, to be intentional, to be connected. Um, and again, Rev Groups is a great uh, uh, platform to, to do that, to get to know um, our fellow uh, brothers and sisters in Christ and um, get to know each other outside of the church. Um, uh, to me, I, you know, I, I feel I, I'm very blessed when I hear people uh, encountering change and, and transformation in their walk with the Lord as we encourage one another and we pray for one another as the Acts uh, talks about. And, you know, one person comes to mind um, that she's been plugged in, um, uh, in in a group that I've been a part of. And, you know, we have a lot of precious people in our church uh, as you get to know them. And I know many of you have. But connect groups uh, or rev groups, uh, I've been able to just encounter some precious treasures of people. They're, to me, I look at them as jewels because they, they they're, again, they have a heart for the Lord, and um, it's a privilege to come together and encourage one another in Him. Um, I'm going to share a little bit about my sister Marie, and I'm going to have her just come up and share her perspective on being connected. Um, but Marie, you know, uh, showed up in uh, my home and I know she felt comfortable enough in a, in a safe environment to share things that you know she was dealing with and you know God has been laying her on my heart to pray for her and um, I know she's dealt with some anxiety like not to the level that perhaps I'm experiencing right now <laughs> but you know Having re being re you know relating to her anxiety, I, I know um, we need to pray over these things and take authority over them in his in his word. And you know, recently she was just sharing, you know, um, that she was taking a certain amount of medication for anxiety, and she just casually stated, "You know what, Ramon?" Or she shared in our group that she's no longer taking them. Is that correct? Amen. Not as much. So again. To, oper to, to walk in greater freedom. And again, it's a process, but to me, that so encouraged me. And being part of a uh, you know, rev group you know, facilitates being able to connect with people. And again, um, I, I feel we need to be intentional, intention, intentional um, in these groups to pray for one another as the word instructs us to do that. And to see, that's just one example of many that I've encountered. And I'm just very encouraged. Um, and I, again, felt led to kind of share that to encourage others that may feel 
apprehensive or on the fence like I was and complacent and um, God doesn't want us to be complacent, you know, uh, and it's only being connected in, in, in there's many platforms to do that, whether it's the prayer group on Saturday mornings or the rev groups um, to be connected and, and encourage one another. So I'm going to have um, Marie just kind of share a little bit about her experience in, in being connected. So Miss Marie. Thank you, Ramon. And now I am as anxious as you. <laughs> I'm not good about this either. Um, <clears throat> since coming back to this part of Florida, um, I've been to several churches. And I've still got some um, acquaintances. <laughs> uh, but none that really felt like family until revolution. Um, being, love you too, being um, asked to join Ramon's group um, really gave me an outlet to um, connect with a bunch of people here uh, that I felt like I was not alone anymore because I don't have any family here, not blood family. Um, <clears throat> people that I can call at any given time if I need them. My car breaks down. Um, yeah, I've got friends, but they live like a ways away. And I know if I need to, I can call anyone and not worry about being judged for it. Um, the one uh, Psalm that really has gotten me through a lot um, and it's only been since coming here, is uh, Psalms 37.4, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. And he knew the desires of my heart was to have a family where I could feel secure and safe, not judged, and I could be a part of something bigger than myself. So I thank you all for that, and I praise God, and I thank him so much for that. But this is what I feel that he has led me to tell you about small groups. So God bless you all. Thank you, sweetie. So if you have any questions or feel kind of inspired to plug into a rev group, um, just come see me and I'll be more than glad to go over any information or questions that you may have. And now I'll just pass it over to Pastor. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor Ramon. Thank you, thank you. And thank you, Marie. And you are very, very loved. Yes, you are. Mm. Well, thank you very much. And I know it, and it, and it feels very, very good. I, it really, really does. So thank you so much for that. And you guys can, sh and we love Meredith, too. And you can show me how much you love me by being here Wednesday nights, right? Be here Wednesday. I'm serious. No, for real. For real. For real, dog. You need to be here on Wednesday night, man. This will change your life for a, in a good way. So please. Come be a part of that thing. All right, so we're going to uh, we're going to land the plane on our study of um, of Philemon tonight. And uh, so if you if you don't mind, you can open up your your uh, Bible to that. Am I, am I am I messed up? Am I good? Did I screw up the order or anything like that? Oh, I just you never know. I don't. It's me. Y'all. All right. Let's put on all of our lights out there so they can read their Bibles. Let's get this thing going. I'm excited about preaching. Um, so when you go, when, as you're opening up to Philemon, I just want to say this. As I was getting ready to to um, to to prepare for this thing and get ready to preach, it dawned on me that that we just love beautiful things, right? Uh, put on that first picture that I put there on the file. There, just see, isn't that just pretty? No, I just drawn to that. Who, who honestly, who wants to just run through that meadow right now? Come on, right? I would love to do that. It's just absolutely beautiful. And no matter what it is that we feel is beautiful, the, some people think the beach is beautiful and the mountains and, and, and going to the lake and going fishing. There's all kinds of beautiful things. I was drawn to my wife. She's extremely beautiful. Uh, people are, are, are drawn to, to uh, a good meal you know, and the presentation of it all. You know, it's one, it's, who, who likes green peppers? Anybody like green peppers? But isn't it prettier when they're orange and red? Right? They're just beautiful. You're just drawn to it when it's pretty, right? When things are beautiful, you're just drawn to it. 
And so that's why we've been studying this book of Philemon. We want to, we want to let the Lord do something beautiful. We want to let the Lord change us and be something beautiful so that people can see a, a, a beautiful God. We want to allow in this series, Get Real, A Real Christian Is, we want to allow God to make something beautiful here in us. And then we want to, as part of our mission statement says, to take that beauty to the world. Amen? That's the challenge here. And so that's why we've been studying through the book of Philemon. And so here, when I started this thing out several weeks ago, I share with you a, a very discouraging stat. I think you may have remembered it. But it said that the Pew Research Group has determined, after taking a large-scale poll, that it's no longer 70% of the people in our country that believe in God that they're Christians. Now it's down to 56% of Americans believe in the God of the Bible. And, and yeah, ouch is right. And this should bother us. It should bother everyone who can hear my voice right now. And it should cause us to act. And it should cause us to want to turn the tide. Maybe not in Indonesia. Maybe not in, 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 in Russia. Maybe not in the Ukraine. But, but here, right? Uh, we live here. Where did God place you? He placed you here. And, and, and on our watch and on this calendar, we should make every effort to turn the tide from this downfall of Christianity in our nation. 56% of people believe in the God of the Bible. It bothers me, and I hope it bothers you. You know one of the reasons why this is happening? Because of morons like this. You remember these people? I, I, t I introduced you to these morons the first week we started in this series. This is Westboro Baptist Church. Listen, Westboro Baptist Church. Okay, I'm not a Baptist, I'm not a Presbyterian, I'm not Catholic, I'm not uh, Episcopalian, I'm not any of those things. I'm a Christ follower, okay? That was, a, that was a great place for an amen, okay? So, but, but here's the thing. Baptists is a denomination of Christianity. It's an expression they believe. When they read the Bible, they see something a certain way. But Baptist, absolutely Christian. And this church is a Christian church, and look at this. Have you ever seen something so stupid in your life? When they read the Bible, that's what they see. And it causes people to move away from Jesus. Beautiful things draw people to themselves. Okay? This is not, there's no one in this room in their right mind that would say what they see up in the screen is beautiful at all. But see, what Jesus does, when he says, I'm going to build my church and the gates of hell are, will not prevail against us. When Jesus builds his church, he builds it on the authentic follower of Christ. The ones who open it, read it, and do it. Right? Let's hear that. Open it, read it, and do it. Right? There are those in this world, like the, the foolish folks at Westboro Baptist Church, that diminish the beauty of Christianity because of their false expression of such faith. When all the while, the, the Son of God himself, you think about Jesus, the Son of God himself is beautiful. Think of all that he did. Think of all that he taught, right? Think of all, look at what he, he would feed people. He would love people. He would pray for people, right? He never did anything bad to anyone. He, he himself is a beautiful person, would you agree? And the Bible, the Word of God, is, is, is perfect in its description of who this Jesus is and what it should look like to live out the Christian faith. And so with a humble, teachable spirit, we gather here each and every weekend to adjust our lives according to the way He wants it to be lived out for Him and His glory. And that's why you're here. And so what I want to do is I want to land the plane on this thing. Just six things I wanted to mention real quick. I'm, they're going to come at you quicker because we went over a lot of this stuff already. Some of it might be fresh. Some of it may not. But bear with me as we go through it. I want to welcome those who are watching on Facebook Live from all over the country. We have more and more people watching every single week. And so thank you for being part of our extended family here at Revolution. No matter where you are, you're loved. And we thank you for being part of our church. Here's the first thing. God always calls people higher. God always calls people higher. You know, this book was written by Paul, the Apostle Paul, to this guy, I call him Phil, right? How many people call him Philemon in the house? Show me. How many people call him Philemon? 
How many people call him Phil? Phil. Awesome, rocking and true. Okay, so, so Paul writes this letter to, to, to Phil, right? And he is, he's written this letter not to the guy who shows up for church every three weeks. He, he's not writing to the guy who blows off his small group all the time to go, you know, watch a game. He's not writing that to them. I don't know what's going on with that, but bear with me. He's not writing this letter to that guy or that girl. No, he's writing it to someone that he refers to as a co-worker, as a fellow soldier, right? What does that mean? He's been in the trenches with this dude, right? He's fought for the faith. He calls him a fellow soldier. He's the hospitable pastor who opens up his home to have a church there. And it says here that he, is off, he, is, he has loved and refreshed the saints often. That's what Paul says of Phil. So he's not some church slacker. He's not the one who comes on Christmas and Easter. He's there all the time in the trenches fighting the good fight of faith alongside with Paul. But yet he says, he calls him in this letter to a greater participation and a greater amount of generosity in the faith. As a matter of fact, he would just say that he wants, a, he wants his, his generosity to like start. If you read the Bible, if you read what it says, I wanna, I, this is not a really good um, version here on this one text, but it says that I am praying that you will put into action the generosity that comes from your faith. Right? The, but the Holman Christian Standard says something different. I can't remember exactly what it says, but it says, I, I want it to like to begin. It's like, I want you, I want something to happen because of, of, your, of your faith. But yet he's already committed to this, uh, he's already committed himself greatly, this Philemon, to the faith. You see, he's refreshed the, the hearts of the saints often. So it's not like he hasn't been working at it, but somehow Paul says, Let, let's just, let's jumpstart your generosity. Let's jumpstart your participation. He's always calling us upward, all right? Never enough. And he says, this is how you do it. He goes on in the text, it says that your generosity and your participation in the faith would grow as you know or understand and, 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 and to experience, not just to know about what Jesus has done for you, not just to, to understand what Jesus has done for you, but to experience it. He says, when you start to experience more comfort from the Holy Spirit. When you start to experience more provision from the Lord, when you begin to experience a greater level of peace and a greater level of joy, as you know and understand and experience all, of, all that God in Christ has given you, the response to serve should increase. And so as you come here each and every week and hear the word of God proclaimed over you, and as you grab your Bible and find your private place where you sit with the Word of God every single day, and you study the Word of God, and you meditate on the Word of God, you, this should be something happening. Pastor Jay mentioned it. You should produce fruit. God is a God. He is very task-oriented, God is. Don't make a mistake about this. That's why he's called the Father. He's a man, right? He is task-oriented. He wants something done. He wants fruit. He wants something to have, he wants, listen, he wants kingdom advancement either in you or through you, but mostly both. That's what he's looking for. And as you know and understand and experience all those things that God has deposited into you and done for you through the study of his word, he wants you to produce fruit. He wants results. He wants something from his investment. John chapter 15 verse 16 would say this. Jesus says, I have appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. So Jesus has chosen, he's pointing at you, Christian, he's pointing at you, Jenny, he's pointing at you, Holly, he said, I have appointed you. So now you have a new job, right? Remember your old job? Jesus is like, no, but I have appointed you to do this, to produce lasting fruit. Go produce results for me. I've given you some things. I've done some things for you on the cross. I've deposited gifting inside of you. I've given you my Holy Spirit himself. I've given you freedom. I've given you eternal life. And now I want to see something in return. That's what he says. I have appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit. John 15, 2 says this. I prune the branches that do produce fruit so that they can produce even more. You see, that's what Paul's doing to Philemon. He's going to the one 
who is producing fruit. You have loved the Lord. You have loved the people. You have refreshed the hearts of the saints often. But now I'm going to prune something away so that you can refresh the saints even more. That your participation in the faith would be effective. That's the word in the Holman Christian Standard that I forgot. He says, I want, your, I, want, I want your participation to be effective. As if his participation already was not effective. But yet we know that it was. Because he commented on it. He complimented him on it. But listen, brother, I want you to step up and do more. I want, it to be, I want there to be a higher calling on your life. I want you to produce more fruit. Never stagnant. Never complacent. Never lethargic or prideful. Never think, thinking to yourself, well, I've done a lot for the Lord. What about the lady who, who sat next to me last week who's not here right now? You need to be talking to, to, to him. You need to be talking to her. No, 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 no. Never let pride get in the way of a higher calling. Don't ever think you've done enough. And maybe if the other folks would catch up to me, man, this message was for her. No, this message is for you. Sometimes the message is for the, the folks that don't come to church. Like when we talk about gathering. You know, Hebrews 10, 24 and 25, don't neglect the gathering together of the saints as some people make a habit of doing. That message is always for the ones who aren't here. And you're like, man, I wish that they were here. Well, if they were here, they wouldn't need to hear that message. But this message of Philemon is for the ones who are sitting in the church right now. The ones who are committed to coming. The ones who are already serving here at Revolution. Maybe you're already doing something. Maybe you're doing a lot. Wasn't Philemon doing a lot? He was pastoring the church. He had refreshed the saints often. And Paul says, I want your participation to be effective. In other words, step up. Do more. Always more. Never lethargic. Never complacent. Never lazy. Always striving to do more and more and more. More learning. More serving. Greater obedience. Greater generosity all the time. Never stopping. Always increasing. Someone say amen. amen. Awesome. So this is what Paul is calling the church that meets in Philemon's house to do. He's like, I want you to do more, Philemon. I want more, Aphia. I want more, Archippus. And all of those in your church that are participating, but I want more. In this case, he says, I want you to change your thinking on this Onesimus. Now, you've loved the saints, and you've refreshed them. You've done good things, but here's a whole different breed of saint now. Now I've got a criminal coming to you. Now i got a slave coming. These are not your, your, your counterparts, the ones that you work with, the ones that are on your social scale, the ones that look like you, talk like you, act like you, dress like you. It's okay for you to be part of that fellowship, but now I'm bringing someone else in. Do you, see, did you, do you feel him clipping the branches? He's pruning. You already accept people, but here's a challenge, and I need you to get away from this type of thinking that we all have about putting people into groups, and your sin's okay, but your sin's not, and I can hang out with you, but I can't hang out with you. I want to get rid of all that thinking. Here comes the, the former slave. Here comes the, the former thief, and now I want you to accept him as a brother. I want you to forgive sin, not just when Carl sins against Roger, like, it's okay for me to do that. Oh, it's okay. Just forgive him. No, no, no. Now this guy stole from you, Phil, and I'm calling you to forgive him. I'm, I'm asking you to, to take his, his sin and let him repent and let it be okay. Forgive his sin. Put all Christians on a level playing field. Nobody is better. Nobody is worse. There's neither Jew nor Gentile. Man or woman, slave or free, black, white, rich, poor, all are equal. One body, one Lord, one faith, one hope, and one church. God always calls you higher. So I want to challenge you all. As we, when you hear these announcements about things to do, don't think it's for the next guy or girl. Don't think that just because you show up on a weekend service that you've done what you're supposed to do. Do something. If you're doing something, do more. It takes huge sacrifice to, to do this, right? This is not easy, the work of the ministry. It calls for a massive amount of sacrifice. And over the years here in our church, I'm unashamed to say that when I pushed people like this, they left. They left. And I, wanted, I, I think I'm, I, I'm, I'm believing for greater things concerning you guys, though. 
I think that you're a different bunch. I think that you want to see the pews filled. I think you want to see the altar packed with repented sinners. I think you want to see the tide turn. I think that you're not happy with 56% of Americans believing in God. That you're not satisfied with that number. I'm not satisfied with that number. I want to see, I don't know about other states. I don't know about Indiana and I don't know about California and New York. But in Central Florida, God put me here and you here. We should change that. I don't think we should be satisfied with 56%. So we always are called higher. So let's all step in and do more. Amen? Amen. So here's the second thing. A real Christian engages. Engages. This is all kind of flowing one right on top of each other. It's almost like they're the same topic. But a real Christian engages. Proverbs 13, 24 says that the one who loves his child disciplines him diligently. When I say a a Christian engages and I quote a parenting verse, it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense, but just hear me out. Jesus said, this command I give to you, love one another, right? Love one another. So if loving someone means you discipline them diligently, if you have a child, you understand that when that child is getting close to a cliff, about to go off the highway, right, you, you step in and you do something, correct? You don't just let it happen. You wouldn't just see your kid about to, 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 to drive down the road on their bicycle into oncoming traffic and just stand there and go, oh, they'll be all right. W- would you? Okay, so a real Christian engages. If you love someone, you speak up. You say something, right? You say something. You don't just let it happen. You, if you love someone, you engage. And let's debunk this ever-famous but often false expression of nobody can judge me but God. Okay, this part of this engaging thing, okay? People too often say that. No one can judge me except God. Only God can judge me. Anyone ever heard that one before? Everybody, show me your hands. Let me see if how, how bad teaching has permeated our culture. It's awful. 1 Corinthians 5.12 says, It certainly is your responsibility to judge those inside the church. Okay? Don't think you got up easy because you sinned in the parking lot, yo. That's not what it means. It doesn't mean you can get away with stuff because you're at your car. It doesn't mean whether you're in this building or not. In the church means the ones who have accepted Christ who say they're living by this. It certainly is your responsibility to go up and judge their behavior. This is what our church calls chapter and verse, right? Chapter and verse, brother. Chapter and verse, sister, I see that what you're doing is this, but the word of God says this. And you share that with them gently and humbly, and you don't expect them to have to say yes, sir, or no, sir. You go up and you engage. How many, how, many, how many disasters in our church family would be avoided? How many marriages in our church family could be saved? How many, how many jail terms could be could be avoided if we that know would step up and say something to someone who's at the edge of the cliff, right? But we don't because we don't want to offend anybody. We're in a politically correct society. Don't say anything about religion. Don't say anything about politics. Stay out of my business. You have no right to tell me what to do. Real Christians obey spiritual authority. And so when one of the pastors in your church comes up to you and says, hey, listen, I see the way you're living. I see what you're saying. I see what you're doing. And the word of God says this. You need to adjust. You don't look at them and say, you have no right to tell me what to do. Yes, we do. Because the word of God that you say you believe says we do. And so you take it and you receive it and you do what it says. I heard some other pastor say this the other day that, in the Baptist church, of which I'm not, but there's this belief, and it's a good thing, of the autonomy of the Christian church. That each church is not run by some office somewhere out of state, but that the, the Lord appoints pastors and elders and such into the church to oversee the flock that God has entrusted to them, right? And so that no one should tell a, another church like how they should do stuff and all that, but it's gone beyond that to the autonomy of the Christian believer, that somehow all believers think that they can just do whatever's right in their own eyes. And when the pastor comes up to them and says, hey, listen, the, 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 Lord, the Lord's word says this. This is what we should be doing. This is how we should be acting, right? 
But how often are people just going, yeah, that's cool, but I'm going fishing this weekend? How many people say, yeah, that's cool, and I believe what it says, except um, I got tickets to Disney, so I'm just... I mean, it's, it's, it's sort of funny, but it's sad. And I'm, I, but what, why? What, what right do we have as people who call themselves Christ followers to not sit under the authority that God has placed in your life? And then you wonder why churches don't function as they should because no one's doing what it says to do. So we need to engage people. And look at Philemon. Look at verse 9 in the book of uh, Phil here. Look what it says. Why, why am I asking you to higher ground, Phil? Why? What does it say? Because of our love. You see? The real Christian engages because you actually do love the person. That's why he's calling Philemon to a higher ground, to a higher standard of living, to a higher uh, practice of his faith because of the love that they have for one another. He called him a beloved co-worker. Love always calls you higher. See, a real Christian engages and speaks up so that others don't fall off the cliff or run off the road. They help a brother to avoid failure. And then also they engage after the failure. Galatians 6.1 would tell us that if any brother or sister is caught up in sin, those who are godly, those Christians, brothers and sisters, should gently help them back. Gently. Someone say gently. Okay, that's not a Facebook rip. Gently, that's a chapter and verse. I come beside you, I sit next to you, I love you. This is what you're doing, this is where you failed. Let me show you where to fix that. Gently bring them back into proper relationship with the Lord vertically. Gently bring them back into relationship with their wife or their husband. Gently bring them back into relationship with each other. If there's two people in this church that I love, I'm giving you a heads up, if I love the both of you and you are fighting, I'm going to get between it. And I'm going to come after both of you and I'm going to ask you to sit down at the table and we're going to work it out because that's what real Christians do. Amen? Amen? And I'm encouraging you to do the same exact thing. Here's the third thing. A real Christian is committed. Is committed. Do you know that all that Paul had to do to avoid being, as he would say, being in chains for preaching is to stop preaching. That's all he had to do was shut up. If he would just be quiet, he could just slide into heaven, right? Because he's already said yes to Jesus, and so his sins are forgiven, he's placed into the family, and he could just shut his mouth Everything would be just fine. Except the committed Christian doesn't just understand their commitment to their salvation. They understand the commitment to their calling. Okay? They understand the commitment to the calling. And when Jesus calls you, 1 Corinthians 9.16, Paul would say, I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not. Woe means grief. Woe means grief. How many people agree that Paul is going to go to heaven? Right? But yet, even though he knew that, he was the one who explained what salvation is, how to get in, right? He knew he was in, but yet he also knew that he had a calling on top of his salvation. There was something that was being asked of him, demanded of him. Nobody wants to hear that in America. Don't tell me what to do, boy. But he, you're being demanded to do something. He said, woe to me if I do not preach. I'm already in, but woe to me. That means grief is coming my way. That if I, I know I'm getting in, but one day I'm going to have to look into the eyes of Jesus and give an answer for the reason why I was lazy and lethargic and complacent and shy and, and ran away like a little baby and didn't do what you told me to do. Woe to me if I do not preach. <clears throat> and being committed to Jesus means... Also, that you're willing to receive any and all results of such commitment, whether they are good or bad. That's what being committed looks like. Paul was a special guy. He didn't just have, like, a guy like me standing him up and telling him, like, hey, you should do this or you should do that. He had the Holy Spirit like talking to him, 
Jesus talking to him, right? He, and, and, and we're talking about commitment. We're talking about receiving with joy all the results of this commitment. And in Acts chapter 20, verse 23, the Apostle Paul says that the Holy Spirit tells me in city after city that jail and suffering lie ahead. Now let's just debunk this whole idea of when God wants you to do something, when you're trying to pray through something and you're trying to decide what to do, that the peaceful road, he'll give me peace with that. Let's just kind of throw this verse on top of that. How much peace is in that? That it's going to go, when you do it God's way, it goes easy. Anyone ever hear, anyone tell you that? I hear it all the time, right? You do it God's way, it's going to come easy. God's way was that every city he would go to, there would be jail, persecution, suffering, whipped and beaten and imprisoned, starved, right? This is, how much peace is in that? So is it always true that God's way is the easy, smooth way? If we're looking for two different, I've got this I could do, i got this I could do, and whichever one, the doors open up and it just seems to go peaceful and smooth, that's God's way. No, no, it isn't. You better check yourself. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I look in the Bible and none of the paths that the apostles and disciples took were peaceful and smooth. They were, they were ridiculously hard. In every city, prison and suffering await me. Did he run away? Did he run off scared like a little baby? No, never, never. He never shied away. He never quit. No, the, a real love for Jesus in the real Christ follower compels them powerfully. This is what Paul would have to say in 2 Timothy 2.10. He would say this. I am willing to endure Anything. That's big, right? Anything. I'm willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and eternal glory in Christ Jesus to those God has chosen. Amen. I'm willing to endure anything? See, a lot of us gathered up here, probably, probably almost as many people as that are in this room right now gathered here Wednesday night to watch this movie called Paul, the Apostle of Christ. It wasn't a uh, an absolute 100% dead-on account from Scripture. Although everything was true about it, um, they, they, this one experience, not to get off the course, but this one experience that Paul had during the whole movie, he's in this prison in Rome, and, and, and him and Luke are quoting all the famous verses that Paul quotes in the Scriptures, but some of them are from Philippians, and some of them are from Ephesians, and some of them are from Colossians. And they just kind of used a little artistic liberty to cram it all into this two hours. And so I can understand. But it was all true. I say that to just say that some of us sat here in this room, and we watched what willing to endure anything if it will bring salvation and an eternal glory to God looks like. And, and in our country... We, 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 we don't even, I love you all. I love you all. I really love you all. I'm happy to be doing this with you, but none of us even have a clue as to what that looks like. Willing to endure anything. See, a real Christ follower, the one who's getting it real, a real Christ follower, he sets aside personal gain and comfort to advance the church. And, and, and we need a lot of that in this country. And one of the reasons why Nations that we used to send missionaries to to get them saved are now turning the tide and they're sending missionaries here to get us saved, which is crazy. The reason why is because we won't endure anything to advance the church. We advance the church when it's convenient for us. We give when it's convenient for us. You, you, why do, why do, you know we have two services here? Do you know why we have two services? We have two services because we want to reach more people. We also have two services to give you an opportunity to exercise what I'm talking about, to sacrifice a little bit. Maybe you come, maybe you come here on Saturday night and you worship, and then you, instead of sleeping in in your own comfort, you sacrifice and you come in and you serve on Sunday so other people can hear this message. Did you ever think about that? 
Did you ever think about maybe giving instead of going out for dinner for the fifth time this week? I mean, I'm just digging, but it's true, right? I mean, we're all, I do this. I'm not like, I haven't graduated. But I'm just saying, this is, what it ta- this is what, in our context, that's what it would look like. You might not go to prison for saying you're a Christ follower, but a Christ follower is willing to endure anything that others would get saved. So maybe you'd sacrifice your sleep in morning and sleep an hour and a half less so that maybe someone would get saved. Come on. Right? It takes all of us to do something awesome, to fulfill the vision that God has for this church. It takes all of us to do it. And even those that are already serving, Paul would tell us, step up and do more. We need more of this perspective in the American church. We need to be thinking, how can I help the church rather than how can the church help me? And that's what we need from people in this country. Here's the fourth thing. A real Christian has no gap. This is probably my favorite week of the whole message series. There is absolutely no lack of sincerity in the American church in 2018. Whatever church you go to, whatever church is out there, they're doing what they believe is right. Like I, I, I would say, and I have, no, I have no fact on this, but I would say the majority of churches, even when they're doing things wrong, very few of them are doing it intentionally because they want to be wicked. I don't, know, I don't know how many churches, even the bozos at Westboro Baptist Church, they believe their signs. They believe that God hates America. They believe that God hates homosexuals. They believe that, that, that rabbis rape kids and all the stupid signs. They believe that, right? They do. There's no lack of sincerity. I think most churches are actually preaching and exercising what they believe. So they're sincere, right? They are. But what I think what we lack is authenticity. Okay, we lack authenticity. Do me a favor, go to Psalm 19. Psalm 19, I have three, three verses I just want to read with you. Psalm 19, verse 14, says this. You guys all there? Okay, don't want to lose you. Let me take a swig. It's a great opportunity to remind you that we're going to be starting a new study on Wednesday nights. It's called Vertical Church, and I think you guys should all come to it. Yeah. Yes, amen? Yeah. Awesome. I just can't think of anything else that will be like more important than learning what the scriptures say about how God wants to be worshipped. Like That would be awesome, right? Oh, that would be incredible. I can't wait to see all of you here Wednesday night. So it starts at 6. Make sure you bring something yummy to share with everybody, because that's what believers do. That should be number 7 on the list. Real believers bring stuff to potluck. May the words of my mouth, right, the things you hear, and the meditation of my heart, the things that are inside that I believe, be pleasing to you. There should be a consistency between the stuff on the outside and the stuff on the inside, right? How about um, 1 Timothy 4.16? Let's go over to the New Testament just to see if maybe... See if it's the same God, the same Spirit inspiring the writing of Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 16. Tell me when you're there. Anybody else need more time? Because if you need more time, I just think this would be a great opportunity to share with you. No. <laughs> Keep a close watch on how you live. What's that? That's external, right? What people can see, what you're teaching, what you're doing, what you're saying, right? Um, Not so much what you're thinking, not so much what you're believing, not in that sentence, not in those words, but what they can see. Keep a close watch on how you live outside and on your teaching. So that's what you're teaching, and then is it actually lining up with what you're doing? Are you doing what you're teaching? Stay true to what is right. So, so we see here we got what's on the outside, what you're living, what you're speaking and teaching, and what is true, which is what? Hold it up, right? This. So it should all be the same, right? What the Word of God is, the truth, and what you, what you live, and what you teach. Why? Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation, 
and the salvation of those who hear you? Isn't this massively important now? Can you feel the weight that God's kind of put on your shoulders right there? The people's salvation is on the line, their eternal destination, their forever either in heaven or a godless hell is on the things that you say and do? That's a lot of weight, isn't it? But God has entrusted this message of the gospel, this truth, to you, and he wants you to handle it with care and make sure that what you believe and what you say and what you do are consistent, no gap. Titus 2, verse 1 says, but you must speak what is consistent with sound teaching. So the things you say, again, the things that you say and the things that are in God's word should line up. The truth, what is believed, what is taught, and what is done should have no gap. They should be identical. And we're studying this book here, Philemon, and Paul is the one who's speaking into Philemon's life. And so the test here is, can you bring down subwoofer for me, please? The test here is to see if Paul is actually authentic. Does he have credibility? Because he's our example, right? And, and Paul tells us to follow him as I follow Christ. So when we want to know what God the Father is, what do we do? We look at God the Son. Do we want to know if God is loving, God the Father is loving? Well, is God the Son loving? Is God the Father uh, merciful? Well, is God the Son merciful? Does God the Father provide? Well, does God the Son provide? And if, now that God the Son has ascended to heaven, and he's not here walking around anymore, he leaves people like Paul. So if we want to know what Jesus Christ is like, we can look at the life of Paul, right? If we want to see what Jesus Christ is like, we can look at the life of Barbara, we could look at the life of Mercy, right? We could look at the life of Lexi. This is what we're supposed to do. Follow me as I follow Christ. So in 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, verse 1 and 2, this is what he says. I solemnly urge you, this is Paul, in the presence of God, and, he's going he's to preach something now. He's going to teach something. Okay, He's going to teach something. So the test is, does it line up with the truth of what Jesus said? And then then does he practice it so that there's no gap? That's the challenge, right? I solemnly urge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus who will someday judge the living and the dead when he comes to set up his kingdom, preach the word of God. Be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Patiently correct, rebuke, and encourage your people with good teaching. Preach the word of God, be prepared whether the time is favorable or not. Some translations would say in season and in out. Some translations would say uh, whether it's easy or hard. So the question is, is if you're in jail for preaching the gospel, what's the only thing you don't want to do? Preach the gospel. Because then you're never getting out. So is the time favorable? Is it easy? Is it in season as we would look at things? No, it's not. It's a very difficult time. I know if I open my mouth right now, I'm never getting out of here. And I've never spent any time in jail, and praise God I haven't. But if you've been in jail, I'd imagine you're not thinking, man, if I could just spend one more night in here, that'd be great. Just maybe one more sentence, maybe a few more years, it'll be so wonderful. No, no one's ever saying that. But, Paul says, you preach the word whether it's favorable or not, whether it's easy or not. And didn't Jesus say, therefore, go make disciples of all people and teach them all that I taught you. So the truth is, go tell people about me. Right? That's the truth. And Paul says, yep, that's the truth, so make sure you do it all the time. So what is true and what is believed are in line. There's no gap, right? And then did he actually do it? Well, verse 10 of Philemon says that Onesimus became my child in the faith while I was here in chains. Paul had no gap. He had no hypocrisy. Truth, belief, taught and done, identical, no gap. Listen, listen. If you can get a person to open up the Bible and read of Jesus Christ, they will see absolutely something beautiful. Do you agree? 
ap- I mean, forget you. If they open the Bible and just read the Gospels, they will see something beautiful. No doubt. But the question is, is will they see that same beauty when they read you? That's no gap. And you're the Bible here on this earth right now. Before anyone would ever open this thing up and start to study, they need to see a reason why they should. And so they need to see beauty in you. They need to see no gap in you. Will you love like Christ? Will you pray for your enemies? Will you forgive consistently? Will you gather consistently? Will you serve wholeheartedly? Will you be kind? Will you be tender-hearted? I don't know. Here's the fifth thing. A real Christian steps up and steps in. This is when we talked about substitutionary atonement. This is Jesus Christ on my cross. Amen? He who knew no sin became sin so that in him you would become the righteousness of God. He took your place. He paid your debt. He shared your burden that you could not pay. And Paul says to Philemon, if Onesimus wronged you or owes you anything, I, Paul, will repay it. Paul stepped in and stepped up and paid and took the place of Onesimus who could not pay the debt. That's what Jesus Christ did for you and me. And that's what Paul did for Onesimus, the runaway slave criminal. He knew he didn't have the money to pay it. He had been a slave and a criminal and most likely in jail next to Paul. He didn't have a whole lot of cash to repay debt. And so Paul the Apostle, although he doesn't have to, he steps in and says, if he owes you anything or wronged you in any way, I will pay the debt. He stepped in and he took care of the debt. Now what does that look like for us? How do we go about doing that? It's a great idea. What do we do? So we have to be active in this. We can't just wait for someone to come up to me and say, hey, I have a problem. Can you help me with it? Like, that's awesome, and we should consider helping them when they come to us. But the Bible would take it a step further. You remember, Jesus is always calling you higher, right? He's never just, he's never saying, be lethargic, just stay in the same place, just keep doing what you're doing. That's never enough. Hebrews 12, 15 says, to look after each other so that none of you fail to receive the grace of God. I wrote active in my notes. That's the word I wrote down. Active, looking for this. Keeping an eye on the people in your faith family. Keeping, keeping tabs on one another. Checking in with people on occasion. Calling them, visiting them, asking them. Small groups are awesome for this. No one's going to rush into this room on a Saturday night and go, you know what, I just watch porn all the time and I need help. No one's going to rush into this room and say, you know what, after church on Saturday night, I can't help it, I keep going out and getting hammered after church. I need help. No one's doing that. But they would do it in a small group. They would go to someone that they know, love, and trust, that they know they will shut their mouth and be there for them and say, brother or sister, I am struggling with this. And the brother and sister in Christ is looking after each other, looking, hey, if th- I, do you need help? Do you need help? I wanna, I'm watching your life. What's going on in your world? Do you need something? Can I help you with something? That's what we're doing. We're actively involved, pursuing the opportunity to serve someone, to help someone, right? Look after one another. And a real church, it, it's not just a cliche to say that we're a family. No, we're really supposed to be a family. We're supposed to care about one another. We're supposed to love one another. We're supposed to look after one another so that nobody fails to receive the grace of God. This is what we called a couple weeks ago that sometimes yoking to him means yoking to his. So when he says, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, come to me and I'll give you rest for your soul because my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Well, Jesus ain't standing here right now. You know that, right? Is that news flash for anybody? No, everyone knows Jesus isn't standing there right now. So you want to hook up to his yoke? You hook up to my yoke. You hook up to her yoke. right? Not so that you can give them more. 
Not like, oh, man, I already got a big yoke. I'm carrying a big load. I don't need any more. But Jesus is like, I can carry the whole universe on my yoke, so coming to my yoke actually helps you. And so maybe you have a yoke, right? All of us have a yoke. You have a yoke? Everyone's got a yoke. We all got burdens that we're carrying, right? But sometimes if you need help, that means yoking up with his people. That means yoking up to him. And that's what we're supposed to do. Look after each other. Bear each other's burdens and you'll fulfill the law of Christ. That's what the scripture would say. Here's the sixth thing. A real Christian is an overcomer. John 16, 33 says, I tell you these things that you will have peace in me. Let me ask you a question. Show of hands. How many people want peace in Christ? Just peace and peace and peace. All of us. Look at that. Every hand up, right? Awesome. Well, he's about to tell you how. I'm telling you these things so you can have peace in me. In this life, you will have trials and sorrows, but take heart or be of good cheer, for I, Jesus said, have overcome the world. Now, when you say amen to that, what are you agreeing to? What are you agreeing with when you say amen? Are you agreeing with the fact that he went to the grave and rose again, and so he's overcome death? Yeah, that's awesome, right? Amen. Are you, are you agreeing that every single human plan and program and habit and social norm and cultural standard and it is what it is and that's just life and what everyone falls for and we all take the bait and this is just the way it's done because we've always done it that way. He's overcome that. He overcame all of that. He conquered it. He crushed it. He overwhelmed it. He prevailed. He dealt with something. He went after it and he killed it. He never took the bait on the things that we take the bait on. He crushed it all. He's never satisfied with the status quo. Ever. Ever, ever. In me, people are new creations. He overcame this stuff. And if you're in him, you can overcome this stuff too. So if you're, if you're in me, you're a new creation. The old dies. The old way of thinking dies. And the new creation, creature, the new person that thinks like Jesus and speaks like Jesus and acts like Jesus and loves like Jesus and forgives like Jesus and lives fearlessly just like Jesus because even though he died, he knew he was going to live. And even though you will die, you know you will live. See, the reality of eternity shaped the temporal life of Jesus Christ. Do you see that? And that's the way it's supposed to be for us. Our eternal life should shape the way we live here, not the other way around. The world would tell you otherwise. How you act here is going to determine what's going to happen there. If you're good enough, you get to go. Fiddlesticks. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible would teach you something different. The Bible would teach you that because of your eternal life, it should impact the way you live here. And Jesus Christ was, was impacted immeasurably by eternal life. And that dictated how he lived here. A new creation that is in him, in me, absolutely surrenders his will to the spirit, the will, and the word of Almighty God. No more are we settling for, well, I'm just the kind of guy who did this. And, and I'm, I've always been the kind of girl who says that. Like, that stuff needs to die. That stuff doesn't live anymore. Whoever you used to be, that person, we shouldn't see that anymore. If you're in Christ, you're a new creation. Thinking different, speaking different, acting different, doing different things. Everything should change. You need a, a sudden and momentous shift in the, over, in, in, in the status quo. See, all of this way of thinking and acting has to be overcome by God. When he said, I have overcome the world, you're part of that world. And before you can overcome anything, God has to overcome you. And you've got to throw your will out the window and say, just like Jesus said, listen, if there's any other way, Father, that'd be great, but your will, not mine. That's what a real believer does. They need a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. The scriptures would say, don't copy the behaviors and customs of this world. 
But let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Right? The way we think is wrong. Like I said last week, there's two times in Scripture it says there's a way that seems right to man, but in the end it leads to death. And when we look at the landscape of all of this world and all over time, no matter what nation you lived in, no matter what empire you lived in, no matter what religion you said you, you followed, our plans are not really good. We, we, we sow and we reap poor crop when we're left to our own. There's a way that seems right to man, but in the end, it just leads to death. And so as we close up this message and this series, I just want to say this, that there's no shortage of sincere yet poor Christianity out there. And it keeps people from Jesus and from his church. But Psalm 37, 23 says this, that the Lord directs the steps of the godly. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. And he's directed us, he's, he's told us right here, this is, what, this is who I am, and this is how you should live. He's looking for the open it, read it, do it people, right? That's authentic Christianity. And I would just ask you to, to consider this, that we would be that type of people here at our church that, do, that displays an authentic faith, a faith that's beautiful, a faith that would attract people toward Jesus rather than push them away. A real Christian has had a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. They're not looking for one. They have had one. And listen, the world needs a sudden and momentous shift in the status quo. 56%, listen up everyone, 56% of our country believes in the God of the Bible. If, if ever the people in our nation need a radical, sudden, and momentous shift in the status quo, they need a revolution. It's not just our name. It's what Jesus came to start. That's what Jesus gifted you to continue. And that's what Jesus is going to come back and gather someday. And I don't know about you, but I want to be able to stand before my king one day. And I know this is terrible to say it. But envision, this is terrible, just bear with me. Envision Santa Claus, right, with his big bag on his shoulder, right? But instead of being filled with toys, it's filled with souls. And you cast it down before your Lord and you say, Father, this is, this is what I've done. I hope that you're pleased. I want to bring that big bag to him. I want you guys to join me in that. That's always been my dream. It's probably stupid because it has Santa Claus in it, but <clears throat> it's my dream nevertheless. So I want to be that kind of church. Amen? Let's pray, and then we're going to worship one more time before we go. thank you, Lord, for this message. I thank you for this series. I thank you for the Apostle Paul, for that amazing example that he set for us. Not just calling us higher to serve you greater, to be more generous, to, to learn more, to, to love more, to forgive more, to never be satisfied with the status quo but to model Christ-like behavior as he was teaching, to engage with people, to call people to something higher. I thank you, Lord, that this church here at Revolution, that we're that kind of church, that the people who come to this church, Lord, the ones that you've brought here, they're the ones that, are, that, that, that want to be called higher. We're the ones that want to do more for you. We're the ones who want to see your kingdom come. We're the ones who want to sacrifice of our own comfort and our own leisure, and our own resource to see others come to know you. That we'd be willing to endure anything that others might be saved, that the church might grow, that you, Lord, would receive more glory. That's our heart's desire. 